welcome to the Spokesman Review podcast. Uh, my name is Alina Perry. I'm the K-12 education reporter. And with me today, we've got Superintendent Chris Reichtal, who is the current uh, superintendent of public instruction, right? That's your title? Right on. Um, yeah. yeah, and you're running for uh, another term. Um, so I was hoping we could get started with, I thought, um, if you could just introduce yourself for folks who, you know, may not be super in tune with uh, state education politics and, yeah. 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 Again, I'm Chris Rakedahl, superintendent of public instruction. We usually say, like, superintendent of public schools because people say, well, what does public instruction mean? Mm. It kind of matters in our constitution, so we're in charge of you know, making sure that money by legislative formula gets to districts. We set learning standards in our office. So when we say, what should fourth graders know in math or eighth graders in reading, those standards, you know, they're pretty consistent around the country, but we put the nuance in that in our organization. Um, we collect a lot of data, performance data, assessment data, fiscal data, and all of that. And then there's just a ton of other functions from civil rights enforcement, uh, when we think students' civil rights are being uh, violated meals, school meals, just a ton of stuff. I always say to folks, if you can imagine being back in school, every job you saw happen in a school from teacher to paraeducator to cafeteria to principal, there's a job alike and a technical assistance team at OSPI to help that person in some way. So that's what we do. And my background is I'm a born and raised Washingtonian. I grew up in Snohomish, a little town of antiques uh, east of Everett. Went to Washington State University, first in my family to go straight to college. And so go Cougs. Go Cougs. Uh, it sounds like we've gone from a pack two to a pack six today. Yeah. Uh, so things are happening pretty pretty beautifully there. But we need a couple more schools. So UNLV, if you're out there, we're coming for you. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, welcome to the podcast today. Um, I figured we'd just jump right in and start with, um, you know, obviously you're the incumbent in this election. You've got two terms under your belt. Um, could you start by telling me why you think you are the better of the two candidates? Just kind of make your pitch to our listeners, to Spokane voters, why why you should be given a third term. You know, experience matters everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're getting an operation from your doctor, or you're getting dental work, or you're being represented in court, or you're building something. You you want people with experience and background. And so, number one, that's just a big distinction. Um, I've had every role in a, a education. Again, experienced it as a kid in poverty, and my oldest six siblings spent some time in the foster care system. So seeing it from the human services side and my family being rebuilt and then me coming into that family, I've seen the human aspect when government does a beautiful job supporting families, and then it was public school that just gave me my, my hope and my opportunity. So I've experienced it firsthand as a born and raised Washingtonian. I became a school teacher. I've served on a school board. Um, I served 14 years working in the community and technical college system, so receiving our K-12 students into a higher ed system that's both academically focused, but it's also very career and tech ed focused. Um, I was a summer custodian in public schools, as a matter of fact, cleaning gum under desks, uh, getting ready for the next school year. I did that as a summer in college, all, all the way to serving in the legislature for three terms. This role, I've been on a foundation board, and I founded a scholarship in my community to get young people who were interested in being either early childhood ed providers or paraeducators or teachers their first couple years of college paid for. So I've been a part of the system that's tried to build it holistically, and I just think it's a huge distinction between my opponent and I. I have huge respect for anyone who runs for office, but we've been through a lot in schools. We've made a lot of investment. That's regressed a little bit. We've made huge progress on a ton of things we'll cover today, but there's more work to do, and I think the experience is what pushes us past COVID and into the next phase of innovation. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and, okay, I was going to bring this up. You've, you've told me before you think experience matters, um, and you said it again. Um, could you tell me a little bit, and you touched on this a little bit, um, but what experience you have and how you think that's going to impact uh, how you will continue to have this role in public education. When you think specifically about the superintendent's office, it's established in the Constitution to be the champion of public ed, <clears throat> to set these learning standards, to hold districts accountable in terms of their financial investments and, and other things. Having worked in schools, not just as a school board member, but also worked in schools and gone through public school in this state, not another state, it's the it's the unique perspective of knowing what's needed and, and how to listen to folks who, who have a perspective on what they still need. So that experience matters. Serving the legislature was huge. All of our money that is state appropriated comes through our legislature. It's now 75% of school budgets. Uh, we've got local levies down to less than 17% on average. And then the federal government's only 6 or 7% of our budgets now. So 
having served in the legislature, you really understand that the, the dynamics of the four caucuses, the House and Senate conflicts, the role of the executive branch, how to move policy, how to move budgets. Um, this is an experience I have that my opponent has you know, no experience in. And so these things matter. And then, again, being in higher ed, I got to build dual credit programs from the higher ed side. So how do we get more kids running start credits in college and high school and AP and then receive them and support them? So this experience isn't just sort of theoretical. It's very lived. I spent my whole life supporting public education in this state. Um, short of two years of grad school at North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, I'm also a Tar Heel. So that's that was fun. But I came home, and this is where I've been for 25 years. Nice. Yeah. Um, Okay, another uh, general question. Um, what do you see as the role of public education in Washington State, and what do you think your job is to make sure it fulfills that role? Well, I still say it's the most democratic institution of opportunity. So I think where my opponent and I often agree in our language is we talk about that there's nothing guaranteed in life. Um, it doesn't guarantee a certain outcome, but it should be the most opportunity-rich thing we create in all of state government, and we do. <clears throat> We're about 43% of the state budget. I'd like to see it at 50% again. That's a goal of mine, and we'll, 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 we'll unveil a budget in a couple of weeks that will get us closer. So when you think about it, this, this idea that a guy like me who came from two people who barely got through middle school, my parents didn't even go to high school, I was sitting there in a classroom just soaking it up as an elementary school student, realizing how powerful the opportunity was. I loved my teachers. They believed in me. I sat next to people who were executives in insurance industries and Boeing leaders and Microsoft leaders and, and their kids. And so this idea that it's this tool where we come together in our neighborhoods and our communities and we can be very diverse and very different but get an equal opportunity, that's what's great about it. It deserves more investment. It deserves more intentionality around high poverty communities and, and families who need more support. So that's the lens I bring. That's what I think we're going to have to deliver on more. We have more kids in the United States today in poverty than at any other time. We're stretching our economy into those who have kind of burst through and have resource a shrinking middle class and a growing number of people who struggle financially. It's public education that will get them through that and give them that opportunity. And so I fight for that and I say it a lot in my campaign. I think we've talked about this. There are people out there who want to actually privatize the system, <laughs> give money to people to take to for-profit corporations or even their religious institutions. And I, I'm a person of faith and so I deeply believe in what I, I believe. But I don't think taxpayers should subsidize my private school choices. Um, and I don't like privately operated boards. I, I have an opponent who still continues to say falsely that charter schools are okay because they're, they're operated and run and controlled by public schools. They're not. Only one in the whole state is, and it happens to be in Spokane. Yeah. But all the rest are privately operated but with taxpayer money. And, and I respect that. <clears throat> it's the law, and I'll uphold the law always. Um, but I don't think that's the best thing for our democracy. I think it resegregates schools um, into different religions and students of race um, by economics. And I just think if we focus on public ed, wholly invest in it, um, get through hard things and be honest about where we struggle. But when we do that well, our economy, our whole state is better off. And that's, that's what I am passionate about is public education. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, and you mentioned in there like um, bridging opportunities, uh, gaps between students, and, and ensuring that that opportunity is there. Um, what 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 do you need specifically to do that? Is is it just money? Is it just upping the the amount that we get from the legislature? Or? I think it's more than that. Okay. <clears throat> so we're a relatively um, average state when it comes to funding. Uh, people can't believe that because the legislature after 2016 put a lot of money in, but they were so far behind the curve that by the time they invested after a court order. Mm -hmm. We got awfully close to the national average, and now we've slipped again. And so it's a little nerdy, but I keep saying to people, imagine that any business puts 3.6% of its profit back into its business. That's what we do in Washington State, or in the United States. 3.6% of the U.S. economy goes towards public education. But in our state, it's barely over 3.1%. Okay. And that half a percent is $4 billion a year. So it is about money. Every student needs more resources. Our educators need more support. But then it's also about targeting. We have about a billion dollars out of our $17 billion a year in our school system that is very specifically focused on high poverty communities and low-income youth. Mm -hmm. It's called Learning Assistance Program. There's federal Title I money, we call it. If you think about meals, when I got here, only 300,000 kids were getting breakfast and lunch. Today, it's over 700,000 kids. And there are other programs like this that focus on students who need the most resources. I think we can do even better, but it's a billion dollars or more a year now. And I, I, I do think if we 
float all boats with the ample resources that schools deserve, we'll be better off and then target some of that even more specifically to families and communities who need it more. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Um, now, okay, I was hoping to jump into some specific sort of policy position stuff. Um, you mentioned charter schools. Uh, that's something, again, we've talked a little bit extensively about. Um, but I guess where do you see that that going? Like, do you see the whole charter school issue needing to be relitigated? Do you think there's more legislation that's needed to regulate charter schools? Uh, what's what's next in, in that conversation? I think a brief history is important. Uh, folks put this on the ballot a few times for voters and it failed. It did ultimately pass in a very close election and then the courts had to dismiss it because it was being funded with uh, what we call common school dollars and the court recognized these are not common schools. They're not under locally elected school boards except in case of one of them. And the fix there was to put a different revenue source associated with it. So the legislature did that. So their law now, there was a cap on how many could be created in a certain period of time. And that time line has ended. So today, I don't have the exact number, but I think it's 17 or 18 charter schools right now, maybe plus or minus a few. Yeah. I know they want to bring more in. My message is I, I understand it cognitively people want choices and what we keep saying is we have all of these amazing choices in our schools from dual language programs which we're opening in Spokane now which is exciting um, all the way to you know career and tech ed opportunities at skill centers by high school and we've got science schools and stem schools and just so many options we've created so I would rather invest in our public school system that is in my opinion because they're locally controlled by locally elected school boards more accountable <clears throat> Um, the failure rate is, in my opinion, too high in our charter schools, and, and I want to give them credit. We have a very um, we have a very tight charter law compared to other states. There are states that just hand these things out to folks, and they're abysmal. Our law is one of the best in the country, so the rigor around that's really good. But there's still an injustice when you start a school and within a couple years you're closing a school. It's not fair to those kids. So I'd like to see a lot more certainty, financial certainty, on the front end for those. Uh, they're privately operated, they're private boards, so they should bring some guaranteed resource on the front end. So as the state invests, we know we're going to get a long-term play. And then ultimately, I just think there's a better way. I've said it before. I said it when I was a legislator. It would be more powerful, in my opinion, like an initiative where a certain number of parents in the community gathered signatures and said, we want a particular school, give that local school district the right of first refusal. And if they choose not to do that after a signature threshold, then allow these folks to charter with the State Charter Commission. But for out-of-state firms to come into Washington and swoop in here with their sort of corporate model and just pop up a school, they're small, they're not particularly efficient. They do an okay job academically. They're not better or worse statistically, but they do pull resource away from the public school system to fund them. And so here we got a district like Seattle that knows it has too many very tiny little schools they need to get efficient. And yet we have a charter system where almost all of those schools are less than 300 kids. So they're spreading high administrative costs over very few students. So in short, I'm always going to follow the law. I really understand why people want choices. I'd rather build those choices in the public sector. If we're going to have charters, I'd like to see the public school districts get the first chance at opening them and only then have them go independent of the locally elected school board. Okay, yeah. Um, and is this, this is, it's, this is an interesting um, sort of game plan perspective. Is this like something that you're going to actively like push for or advocate for if you're reelected? Or is this more of like, if it did come down to it, ideally, this is my dream for how the system would look. Well, I served on a group in the legislature in my last year or two when the courts had thrown out the charter school law. The Speaker of the House at the time appointed me and a colleague to this like fix it committee, go get it solved, right? And I brought this perspective and I was outvoted and I knew I would be. The votes were there for a privatized system. And I think I think we've learned a lot when roughly a quarter of the charters have started and already folded. I think there's a chance here for policymakers, especially if they're going to open the window, to do something better. Um, I'm not sure there's a political appetite for that, but I'll bring the perspective. It's not my first priority. My first priority would be to say we have the ones we have uh, they're going to try to be as successful as possible. I'm the superintendent of public construction, so I'm going to focus on $4 billion of investment for our schools, more money for safety, more money for mental health, more money for students with disabilities, transportation. I'm going to I'm going to focus on my 295 districts and more than a million kids in the public system. But if they want ideas on how to make a charter system, I think, more effective and ultimately more accountable, um, I will be glad to sit down with folks and offer idea. Okay, yeah. I can see that. Um, 
Okay, so you mentioned the budget again just now um, and funding and school funding is obviously a big one. I think, um, you know, if you ask most people in a school what they need, it would be more money. Um, so there, you mentioned that the it's education is 43% of the state budget right now. Uh, historically, it's been around 50, so and that's kind of where you want it. That's a that's a significant jump. Um, I think last time we talked, you said you had a plan to get um, over, or maybe not a plan, a billion dollars back into public mm-hmm. education um, of the state budget. Um, am I am I paraphrasing you correctly? Yeah, close. So. Okay. Forty-three percent is where we are today. Before the court ruled in, back in 2012, that's kind of where we were hovering back then as well. There are these moments in our state's history where our Supreme Court has to yank the legislature back to the table and say fund schools, and that's when we get to this 50 percent mark. Mm-hmm. And as soon as the court relieves them of the obligation uh, and the oversight, we tend to slip again. And, and I want to be really fair to our legislators, uh, all of them, all, all four caucuses, House, Senate, Republican, Democrats, they got a lot of priorities. So I think what we saw in the last couple of years is during the middle of this pandemic crisis, they were dealing with public health and public safety and housing. And so they invested a lot of money there and they kind of turned to our system and said, well, you have some one time federal money. How about you rely on that and we'll get to you later. Mm -hmm. And I put a budget in front of them two years ago and said, well, the later is now because you will not be back in time for these federal monies to roll off and our districts are going to feel the pinch of inflation. They did some good things, which I'm very grateful for. I think they're behind the curve now. So. The billion I'm offering is 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 these three things that I consider very constitutional. They're behind on special education, transportation, especially in some rural communities, and then this whole idea of inflationary cost on their mandates. We all know in our personal lives what's happening to our insurance rates. If you all haven't looked at your insurance bill for auto and home, you should. It's really out of control. Um, it's eating up school districts. Uh, significantly. So I'm going after these things that are clearly constitutional. That's a billion dollars a year we need just to get back to where we were in 2019, adjusted for inflation. So let's pair these numbers. That's a billion to get us to where we were. I, I just said we're four billion behind if you want to be funded like the average state. And so my budget goes beyond that. It says let's change our model so that we invest more in high poverty communities. Let's have more school counselors and mental health support systems. Let's do a whole lot more to invest in kids who are accelerating in high school and, and can take college classes. Why are we charging any high schooler a fee when we would pay for them to sit in a high school, but the second they're accelerating and they're getting college credit, suddenly we start charging them. I want our universities and colleges to be made whole, but that, that should be the obligation of the state, not the family. So so it's a billion to catch up. It's four billion as the goal to get us just to the national average of funding. And, I, and I've got a budget that delivers, you know, more than half of that uh, in the first two years, which is a lot, uh, but it'll be, it'll be significant. It'll be comprehensive. Um, I'm very proud of the work that our team does. It'll have great support from the system and the legislature will struggle to fund it because uh, short of uh, making changes in priorities, uh, they're going to need additional revenue. And we know we're a state that dramatically overtaxes low-income families, dramatically undertaxes the very wealthy, and as a result, we just don't generate the revenue that other states do. Yeah, okay. Um, so just to clarify, you got this budget proposal and you said it would account for half of that, half of the one billion that you think is needed to get us back to 2019 numbers? No, it does the whole one billion. It gets okay. us about halfway to the four billion halfway that we to the need. Four. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. And I don't know, a billion's kind of a lot of money. Do you feel like there's appetite from the legislature to make this happen? Like, have you have you heard support from them? Or is it kind of like, okay, okay, Chris, that's nice, but it's not going to happen? Well, a little of both. I think they acknowledge, okay. especially for supporting students with disabilities, that they remain behind the curve there. So that's probably a $700 million a year bill alone. And I, and I hear a lot of bipartisan support to keep closing that gap, which is exciting. Uh, a little less excitement around transportation. It hits some districts really hard and others not at all. And if you can't build that powerful coalition at the ground level, it doesn't tend to land well in Olympia. But the inflationary costs on things like insurance and food and fuel and all of that that, that operate and run our schools, um, that's also getting some real traction. Because it's it's not only a way to help schools, but every district needs that stuff. So it's really bipartisan. So I do feel like we'll make a lot of progress this year. Again, it'll take the leadership and experience and the relationships on the Hill uh, that I have. But I, I'm, I'm super proud of our legislators. Again, both sides of the aisle, when they see the biggest challenges, they tend to lean into them. They then fight on how to pay for this stuff. And uh, 
I wish they would be more progressive in their tax code, but but my job is really to get schools funded. I, I had a chance to change the tax code, which I did a lot when I was in legislature, but now I'm just the schools guy on the, ex- on the executive side. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I'm ready to move on past budget. Uh, didn't mean to stay there for so long, but it's an important topic. It's, you know, numbers and stuff. Um, academic achievement is another big one. Um, you, your office has been criticized for uh, test scores. I think I have the numbers um, from spring of this year. Uh, 50% of students met state test score standards in English, 39% in math, and 43.5% in science. Um, what do you what do you make of, of these numbers? Do you are you satisfied with that? Do you think like um, is, is it a priority to raise that for you? Uh, how, is, how is that possible? Um, yeah. Student achievement is, is the priority. It's a priority for all of us, but we always have to contextualize this. So one of the things that's been clear for years is people sort of mislabeling what proficiency means. They're, they, they're now, there's a political organization in our state that now says if you're not proficient in our state test score, you can't read, you can't do math, you can't do science. That is not true. And in fact, they're now saying things like you're not at grade level, which is also false. So this is a great chance for us to talk about this. Our state standards, when we refer to proficiency or getting a three or a four out on the one through four scale, those are students who are achieving at a level that we expect to go to a selective university, take the highest level math and, and, and writing courses without needing any additional assistance. So we more than produce enough students at that level who fill up our colleges and universities. The numbers you cited are those. Those who get a three or four, they are really accelerating into university level mathematics, for example. There's a whole nother chunk of kids that particularly uh, perform well at the high school proficiency level. They're meeting grade level standard. Um, It's more like 70 or 80% of all of our students are grade level and higher. Now, these are students who are also going to need their junior and senior year to keep taking courses, but half of those students go on to college and very few of them need remedial support. So it's been such a challenge to describe for people that we have one of the highest metrics in the country. And when we say proficiency, we don't mean are they at grade level. We mean are they ready to go to a college or university at the highest level, which we get half our kids to by 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And then there's this other chunk, 25 or 30 percent of kids who are absolutely on grade level for high school, but they're going to need a little more help their junior, senior year. So we just got this word from the National Testing Consortium to say, you're all talking about testing wrong. You're all overstating kid failure. Uh, You need to be more honest about it. So we're doing that. We're going to take criticism and people are going to say, oh, you changed it. We're still focused on the threes and fours, but we're also being more honest around what it means to get a two on the test and a one. Our website now calls out college readiness versus high school proficiency. So um, just challenging everyone to update those numbers. That said, The pandemic hit us. Uh, We fell several percentage points down. The whole country did. Uh, Thankfully, in the latest national assessment that we uh, participate in, there are only two states in the U.S. who statistically outperform our eighth graders in reading and seven states that statistically outperform us in math. So we are not the best. I never say that. (laughs) We're not even third in that reading. I want to be clear. There are two states that statistically outperform us, which means that we are equal to or better than 48 other states. And that means there's a lot that are right there with us. We're very similar. My opponent grabs the raw scores. He tries to rank us, which everyone in the assessment world says, don't do that. (laughs) It's a 500-point scale, and if Washington's at a 231 and New Jersey's at a 232, there's no statistical difference between those. He tries to rank us and then say, we used to be eighth, and now we've fallen in the middle of the pack. Um, That is wholly untrue. That's not how those scores work. It's really a measure of who is statistically outperforming you and again, seven states in math, two only in reading. And remember, the U.S. is sixth in the world in reading. So I spend so much time on this, and I'm glad you asked because we always want to improve student achievement. It's awfully hard to do with the mental health struggles that our kids face when there's an entire political cult out there demonizing public schools and telling kids they're in failure when it's not accurate, number one, and it does serious harm to them. They do it because if enough people are disgruntled and enough disinformation goes out there, then people say, well, gosh, why don't you give me a voucher? Why don't I take my kid to my for-profit corporation near me or why not to my church? And this is where I have a philosophical difference with my opponent. He believes in privatization. He would harm the public school system. Even though he wants public schools to be successful, he's willing to put it in this capital marketplace that puts it at serious risk 
for alternatives that quite frankly don't require teachers to be certified. There's no public accountability. They're not locally elected boards. And so it's a risk that is just not worth taking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned there, um, I think you said something about a political cult brewing distrust mm -hmm. in uh, state public education uh, entities. How, how do you come back from that? How do you kind of mend that? Because that's something I've noticed. Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's to be done about addressing distrust, building trust um, in the public, in, in families and parents? Uh, well, yeah. it starts by electing people, again, both sides of the aisle, in the legislature and local government, my role, the governorship, everywhere, that's just honest about it, that recognizes we've got a lot of work to do uh, for students. There's been an impact from COVID. So being honest, but also being honest around where we really sit. There was a ranking that just came out yesterday from uh, Consumer Affairs magazine, and, and Washington's education system is ranked fourth, and they look at test scores, and, they, and it's one system. So I we won't even put a press release out about this. We're very proud of it, but somebody else will come along, use different measures and call us 40th or 32nd or 20th. So what we say is be critical thinkers, go to the official data um, on our OSPI website. But then as a candidate, I've done something on my page for the first time ever. I've got this myth versus fact thing because there's so much misinformation. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing that your readers need to know is like, where did this come from? We know the why people want to privatize. It came out of Florida mostly. So this Moms for Liberty movement that Ron DeSantis curated there, it started as anti-masking and, you know, all the COVID restrictions, they turned it into a scheme to privatize, which they've done a bit in Florida. Um, he did it to set up this sort of national movement when he ran for president. That didn't go very well for him, but that group lives on. And now it's really embedded in, in parts of the country. And, and it's got a toehold here, but I spend so much energy on this because you asked, how do we avoid that? Well, we get real information out. We're honest around where we struggle, but we're really honest around where we have a lot of success. And we challenge people to invest in your community and your public schools, because the second you privatize, you'll never get that back and you'll resegregate schools. And we see that in Arkansas, South Carolina, Louisiana and Florida the most. Texas is getting pretty bad as well. So this came out of very conservative states. Um, it might be their politics. It's not ours. And so talking about it matters a lot, being honest around what the movement is and then fighting for our public schools. Yeah, okay. Um, clock is kind of ticking. I've got about five more minutes left with you. There's a lot. Shorter answers from the superintendent. No, 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 yeah. you're doing great. And I also appreciate how fast you're talking too because you're getting a lot of content in. Um, but... Yeah, uh, something that I really wanted to touch on, which we haven't talked about yet, um, it's very new to me, is this concept of, of your position of the superintendent of public instruction being appointed by the governor rather than elected. Um, I read something that said you were in favor of this being appointed position. Um, I guess, could we just start with like why that is uh, your perspective and, and what you think, how, what changes you think that would do and benefits that might bring and if that is even your perspective, I'm not trying to paraphrase you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about 40% of the states um, appoint my respective role by a governor. Mm -hmm. About 40% of the states do it through a state board of education, but typically that board is appointed by the governor first. And so in 80% of the states, you've got a governor that's got really direct control. In our state and 11 others, so 12 of us, we elect the role. I'm very proud to be elected. I'm running for re-election because that's the system we have, and I, and I swear an oath to our constitution. What I've said is a little more nuanced than that. I do support this if something happens first. <laughs> and the first is that over the last 50 or 60 years, every time there's been a challenge in our state, our legislature has pulled authority away from this office and created separate agencies. So we have such a bureaucracy now, seven or eight different agencies that actually have some control over the K-12 system. Uh, want to know what teacher standards are? That's a different group. You want to know what graduation requirements are? That's a different group. You want to know learning standards? That's mine. You want to know what college access requirements are? That's a whole nother agency. Uh, you want to know what's happening in terms of the charter system? That's a whole nother agency. So, and there's more. There's, there's $300,000 in salaries and benefits being paid to executives in this state, or excuse me, $3 million. Um, to over seven or eight executives doing little tiny functions that in most states are just part of the OSPI. 
And so I've said, if you'll get this thing in order and get this down to two or three where there's more accountability and more focus, then you can ask the question, now that it's consolidated and it's efficient, where is it best situated, directly to the voters, separate from the governor, or under the governor? And what happens, I think, when it's under the governor is the governors are more accountable to public ed. I will always be, whether appointed or elected, uh, because that's the job, but but governors in this state sometimes can run campaigns and talk about everything but education because they say that's somebody else. And so it's worthy of the conversation. You got to do the efficiency first, then I would support it. And the other reason I support it is it'll never happen unless the voters approve it because it's a constitutional amendment. So you get two thirds in the House, two thirds in the Senate, and a majority of our voters to support it, then it should change, right? Like let's, let's not be afraid of constitutional amendments. I think we need more of them. I think there are other offices that should go away as well. I'm I'm pretty honest about that. And I love my colleagues, but I just think there's an accountability that governors should have that they've not had. Uh, but that scares some people because that's also consolidation of power. And some people will say, we don't want that. And our state was kind of founded, you know, 1889s or statehood. That was a period where they were diffuse. They didn't want concentrated power at all. And we live with that 130 years later. So get efficient first, get rid of all these duplicative agencies, get rid of these $3 million worth of collective salaries that are going out to places. And some of these are $200,000 executives with five or six staff members. It's just unnecessary. And so um, I frustrate a lot of people with that message, especially some of those folks and those boards. But um, I think efficiency first, then let's explore this question of where it should sit. And if the voters ultimately want this, then that's what they should get. Okay. Yeah. Um, and do you feel like, like with eliminating some of these um, other educational agencies, do you feel like OSPI has the bandwidth to, to manage their responsibilities that they currently have? Like, like, do you think you can handle that? Like, well, they have staff in these other agencies. Again, they tend to be small, five, six, 10, 15 folks, but those, they're talented staff, so they would carry on those functions, but more concentrated. And you can keep some of these boards. If you want advisory boards on graduation requirements or on teacher prep, which you should, right? You want the colleges and universities who deliver these prep programs to have a say. The question is who should staff them? Do we really need seven or eight executives, every one of them with their own government relations team, every one of them with their own communications directors? It's duplicative. It's unnecessary. It diffuses the system to the point that even the best cooperation doesn't actually create alignment. And I think we can do a lot better. Okay. Okay. Um, would you be in favor of, of that happening, but not a superintendent appointed role? Like, is it is it kind of like you you would take either or it needs to be like the whole kit and caboodle that you'd be supportive of? The first part has to happen. You've got okay. to get efficiency and alignment for the system to operate effectively. And the legislature can do that because they created these agencies. So it's simple majority votes in the House and Senate to get that done. That has to happen. I'm open to either the staying separately elected or under the governor, and I just trust the process. It would require a two-thirds vote of the House and the Senate. The votes probably aren't there. If they are there, though, what I want to do is respect that. I keep saying to Democrats and Republicans, I respect your legislative authority. So if you want to go here and you can get that kind of vote threshold to send it to the voters, then that's the will of the people because these are duly elected members of the House and Senate. Again, I think it's a high bar and I don't expect the second part would happen, but I'm really genuinely open to it because I think it could make governors more accountable. But the beauty is we live in a republic where we elect people who represent us and if they can get it done, I support it. And if they can't, then I'm going to keep working my tail off as an independent elected. No scenario matters, though, and we'll get the efficiency we want until we get all of these disparate agencies aligned. I think common staffing, even if they want to keep the boards where OSPI staffs their boards, that is a significant improvement to accountability. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, well, that's about time. I've talked to you about for about 30 minutes now, um, and I know you're a very busy man, um, but is there anything else before I let you go? Um, that I didn't ask you about or any other lingering final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I'm here in Spokane, so I just always think it's a great opportunity to thank this community. Um, you've got great school districts all over the valley here, uh, also parts west and south and north. And so to the whole region, they've been education leaders genuinely for a very long time. They've had their own struggles with this culture war that's hit us, and now people not necessarily supporting bonds and this 60% threshold. Number one, I think it's terrible and anti-constitutional. We should get to a simple majority. But I want folks to know how hard your school boards are working here, your educators are working 
making amazing kids with innovative programs. And so the beauty of this job is I get to travel the state and see some really, really innovative things in Spokane. Uh, the whole region does some really cool things and very cooperative in many cases. So kudos to the Spokane Public Schools and to everyone around and to everybody else. No matter how ugly politics gets in Washington, D.C., we are the functioning Washington. And when we set aside those culture wars and we focus on our public schools, we do really cool things. Excellent. All right. Well, again, thanks so much for your time today. Um, thank you for watching and for listening. Um, and yeah, great, great show. Thanks a lot.